Just me? Really, guys? Uh, come on up. <laughs> Whatever you like. Come sit next to me, Nate. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, obviously, this is a little bit of a hot-button topic, and so we're here to figure out how to fix it. So we're going to talk about females on the radio. We're all excited. Obviously, these people on the stage, if you're coming here for a fight or finger pointing, you won't get that. What you will get is finding solutions. So that said, we have a lot to cover. We're going to hear from radio. We're going to hear from the industry. We're going to talk a little bit about how we found ourselves here and what we're doing moving forward. So this is a great week to be a female in country radio. When I woke up this morning, five in the top 20. So That seems to be more than 10%. It's, it does. We should just go to bar lines now then, right? So I, just, I, I mean, my ma math wasn't my strong no, suit. No. Panel uh, over. Very exciting right now, obviously, um, and we're going to talk about what we're excited about, the things that we're doing to sort of help equal the playing field. So obviously these are all veteran programmers with a lot of years of experience, and I think that we're going to have to sort of start by acknowledging the fact that this is a hot-button topic and has been for years because there is a legitimate disparity there. So obviously, again, we have people from different formats, so I kind of want to get your take. I mean... Again, it's not finger pointing. There's not one specific thing. It, it could be music cycle. It could be supply and demand. We hear a lot about research. So I'd just like to get each of your takes on sort of how we went from having almost 40% females represented in the top 100 in 1998 to less than 20 last year. I think we should point fingers, by the way. <laughs> I really do. I think it's time to point fingers and to fix the problem. Praise. I've only been in the format for three years, um, so I don't really know what happened necessarily prior to that, but over the last three years, and I think um, right now in particular, the last six months, and seeing what's coming the next little while, um, 2020 needs to be the year of the female, because the music is great, and the artists are great, and so if there's ever a time, I think it needs to be right now. Nate? Oh, I, I, don't, I, I don't think there ever wasn't a time. Um, I mean, we, I think when I last looked, there were um, seven, in the top 70 airplay songs right now, we're playing every female. Like, but we also play more currents than most. Well, we probably play more currents than everyone. Um, <laughs> but, but, but we're locally owned and operated, and we're in the innovation capital of the world in Silicon Valley, so we play a lot of new music. So I don't think it's just a female artist problem. I think it is a new artist problem. And I think there is a tremendous lack of new artist airplay f from both genders, but as a format. I mean, imagine if you were a record company and you didn't play or didn't put out any new music. You only relied on your catalog. That's what we're doing in radio. We're relying on our catalog and we're not breaking new artists, male or female. Right. I mean, I'm sure we're, we're going to delve into every aspect of this topic and we won't be able to cover everything. But one of the things I feel that radio, again, I represent radio, that can be better at this is we go by the same old playbook that is 50 years old, 40 years old. We are reliant on a rating system that when numbers are down, what's the first thing we do? We cut the playlist, stop playing new artists, stop playing new songs, shut the jocks up, and become a jukebox. That may work. Again, we are dependent on ratings, so we are slaves to that. But to me, that keeps me up at night, and I certainly that has affected new artists slash new female artists. Uh, equation, and but that keeps me up at night because that kind of thinking means we are competing with another radio station. That might have been the case 30 years ago. Now we're competing against the DSPs, mm -hmm. YouTube, Amazon Music, and so on, and uh, that to me is one of the key problems that we're facing. And no, none of them play 14 minutes an hour of commercials. Well, that's why I'm wondering if part of this is sort of the chasing trends, right? We have, I think, labels and radio are sort of guilty of that. You have a 
Sam Hunt that comes in and blows up the format, and then labels are signing, you know, the next Sam Hunt, or, and, and I feel like that part of that has been a supply and demand issue from the standpoint of when sort of females went maybe out of cycle, we weren't signing, we weren't developing them, therefore we weren't pushing product to you, so there's an element of there that's inherent upon us as labels as well. It's almost like you got to be the one that's starting the trend because that's in any business you're always going to chase whatever's working but it's the people that go out and do something different that starts the trend and gets the people you know chasing the trend. I think one of the sort of frustrating things that we as promotion people hear is we can't get females to test. <laughs> And obviously, I think if you'd asked any promotion person in this room, call out research is the devil <laughs> when it's not working for you. But I guess the question is, <laughs> when it's working, absolutely, and it's in a trade ad, it's the best thing ever. However, um, I would like for each of you to sort of speak to that, too, because that's been, that's been something that has popped up a lot in the last few years. And I'm wondering if that's a familiarity issue and how do we fix that? I guess you want me to go, you want to go in order? Um, I think... Most of you think this too. Research is a tool. It's not the end all, the be all. Some of you do, some of you don't. It depends on the size of the panel. It depends on how you get it. It depends on who you ask. Um, right now, this week, we have five female records testing in our top 10, but they're all in medium or heavy. So they all have five. I mean, it's Miranda, it's Gabby Barrett, it's Kelsey, um, Ingrid, thank you. And uh, I miss you one, but uh, Ashley McBride. Um, and if you're not playing Ashley McBride, wake up. Um, so, I mean, there's just, there's simply no reason. She goes into great, she, everything she does is amazing, and if you're not playing it, you're missing it. Um, but I think that that's just a tool. And I really think that if you play a song in overnights or nights and you test it and you say it's not testing wrong or not testing good, you're wasting your time. It's got it. I mean, we have five testing in a top 10, all of them over 400 plays. Now, obviously, they're not all in the daytime, it's, but nonetheless, Play it, test it, and male songs test bad too, sometimes. Sometimes, imagine this, it's not a good song. Yeah, I rely on, I rely on our call-out research heavily. However, not until a certain point. You can't ask a listener that doesn't really know the song or knows the song well enough to give an opinion because there is a difference. You can't ask them what they think of a song until you've played it enough, and sometimes that's five or six or 700 spins, not one or 200. But I'm also happy to say that over the last couple of weeks, we've had five females in our top 10 research as well. And that's why I feel like this is the time. Because there's a lot of great music and they're testing. You have to give it the same type of rotation uh, than you've given everything else. I agree, you can't test a song that you've played 200 times all in overnight. Um, but there is a lot of great music by females right now, and so let's, let's make this the year of the female. Well, and also, just to follow that up, and I think you'll agree with, is that so many of the females are new. So it's not like you're testing an artist that's been around for a long time and they're familiar with the artist. So it really does portray the song, even though the, the artists are new. Yeah, if you're gonna use the uh, research as um, a, a catalyst for playing or not playing um, an artist or a song, I think you need to be honest with yourself whether or not did you really give the song a chance? Because, um, it, yeah, it's, what, what do you think? 500 spins, 600 spins at least? Yeah. To get a real take on, because you, basically you're asking your fans to vote on the song and call out. So they, they need to know it. I personally think uh, call-out research is outdated. It, not, not every station, but in the sense of who's picking up the phone to answer, who is taking the time. If you look at where everything's going with social media, you can see how people are streaming. You can look at Shazam. You know, at Radio Disney Country, our goal is to play 60 to 70% female artists. That doesn't mean if you're a female and you're an artist, you just automatically get added. These are good songs by good artists. Well, and I, I think that's one of the things, too, that is a real hot button for me personally, is when I'm told females don't want to hear other females on the radio. I don't, it, you know, and I've makes heard that. Makes me bananas. I've heard that a majority of my career in terrestrial radio, but I've never seen it in writing. 
So well, I always wondered, where did this come from? And same, like, it, to take it away from, like, I love that at the year end, and I'm sorry if this is a bad word, but when you get your Spotify sort of time spent listening effectively, we, right. 106,000 minutes for me last year, and it was Casey Musgraves and mm -hmm. Lucy Silvis and Halsey and any number of things, and I just, I've never understood that, and I've never understood how that can sort of, is the P1 changed? I mean, I, I don't get that. Well, you look at, especially lately, how many women are really empowering other women. You know, you see it everywhere, so I just don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's the case anymore as far as women not wanting to hear women. We have a bunch of women out here. Do you have a problem hearing other women on the radio? And I also think it's important that, um, are there any female artists in the room? You want to be treated equally, right? Not better, equally. Work is hard, but not need to work harder. I think everything needs to be equal. I, you know, we were talking backstage about uh, some of those, some stations that do a specialty female-only show on a Sunday afternoon or whatever. I think that actually can work against what we're trying to do here, not help it. Because then, because with that, you're treating them differently. And what happens if everybody starts to do a specialty female-only show, and that's where you're hearing them, but nowhere else? So I think we need to treat it equally, not, not better, obviously not worse, because I think that's, that, I think that's what's fair. Well, yeah, well, you don't want to marginalize it, right? John? Well, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting you, you, know, you bring up the women don't want to listen to other women. And I've heard that my entire career. And um, it's, it's interesting because the, just a few months ago, I hired a new PM Drive talent. So now I have female and all female air staff from, uh, <laughs> it, but it wasn't intended that way. I just, I had this, uh, this candidate in mind. She, she's fantastic. And so, but I was met with some resistance with the women don't want to hear other women thing. And, uh, you know, I have a morning show with a group of morning show, but the, the, the lead is, is a lady, midday lady, and then nights lady. So um, I had to fight. I had to fight. I actually put the question in our strategic study. Would you listen to another female DJ? And we literally listed out four female DJs in a row throughout the day and so on. And the, res the, the results we got back was, are you nuts? Why are you even asking this question? So I, I don't know where that started. And, and I've heard that in my entire career when uh, I was uh, started out at a pop station in, in LA and I was the music director and my PD had a rule for me when I was doing music, no, fee no two women songs back to back on a pop station. Really? Well, and, that, and that's an, uh, obviously we've seen, we've all seen the tweet you know, about that sort of being the hard standing rule. But you bring up another point that I think is important, which is this seems to be unique to our format. This kind of debate is not happening in pop. I mean, women are ruling the roost over there. So that goes back to my sort of original question where when, when they were also ruling the roost in the late 90s, has it become that the P1 has shifted? I mean, where, where, where did the dis disconnect happen? I think there was a big move in this format in the late 90s to be an AC radio format. And I think that a lot of those, if you go back and look at that, a lot of that had Sarah Evans, uh, uh, um, help me, Faith Hill. Patty, Patty, Patty Carolyn well, Patty Patty Chan, but, I mean, but, but it was all kind of this AC movement, and it really didn't separate us enough from the AC stations. And But it wasn't necessarily female, it was the songs, and I think that's what I wanted to go back to, is it's a lyric-based format. And I, <laughs> Julie and I are both... Um, I have a, if you don't know, we have a female program director um, who also does mornings, uh, but she and I are both out of the demo these days. So we have a music committee, and our committee is made up of listeners that we recruit from different shows, or, and, and most of them are female. And the only time I ever hear a negative about a female song from a female listener is if the content doesn't speak to her, if the lyric doesn't speak to her. But you hear the same thing from guys about other about guy songs. So that's the only thing I've ever heard in that in that regard. But it's not it's not germane to gender, it's germane to lyric. Well and again, David, you coming from outside of the format. Yeah, I mean I I, I can only speak to the last couple years, so I don't know 
uh, it feels like that all started maybe eight or nine years ago, where where uh, it seemed like it started to take a turn. Um, fewer women in the format. Uh, I, I don't know why women can do so well in other formats, but there's a challenge in this format. I, I, I don't know. Um, I think we just need to look to the future, though, and try to fix the problem, because what's happened has already happened. But um, yeah, I'm not sure why that ever, you know, when I, when I look at research, um, you know, if we're doing uh, on KLB or any of our Beasley stations a, uh, an auditorium test or something, um, yeah, there are not a ton of women that test through in those, but I think it's because they were not exposed like the, the male artists were. And so, of course, um, you know, a song that's played a thousand times is going to test a lot better than a song that's played a hundred times. So I think we just need to try and commit going forward to fix it. Well, but I also think that comes from your side. I mean, we, we, again, play a lot of currents, but we also, because I play a lot of currents, we don't do a lot of independent stuff. I mean, we do here and there, but... Lordy knows we have enough songs to play, and there's enough labels in town here that if you're good, you're all, you're probably going to get signed. Um, but we don't, you know, if we're playing every female that's in the top 70, and it's still only 20 acts, that means there's not that many acts out there. So it comes back to the label side. But I think, like you said, it's cyclical. We went through Bro Country, and everyone wanted to sign the next FGL. We went through Sam Hunt explodes and does all the stuff. So we need to find the next Sam Hunt. Now, it's Luke Combs, whatever it is, it's the next, it's chasing the next thing that was hot last time. It's time to start something that's hot now. And, and I think we have a group of artists, some of which we just named, that are testing, that are in the top 10, that are testing great, that are ready for that. Well, I have a question for my fellow panel mates. Um, do you think Taylor leaving the format hurt us? 100%, absolutely. No, I actually we we were talking. No, we were talking. Yeah, I about wasn't this in the yesterday. format then, so I don't know. Well, I mean, it, it, it certainly helped <laughs> pop. Thank you. It, well, no, it did. You're right. I mean, <clears throat> and and again, back in the in the nineties, Faith Hill left the format at the height of that as well. Or you go Dixie Chicks or Dixie, whatever else. Well, I mean, we had. I, we're not. I don't really want to talk about subject, that. But but, but yeah, <laughs> they didn't really leave the format. They just decided to get mad at us. Here we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was. But at the time, think about that. At that time. It argue, they arguably were the biggest act in this format. Right. And they were making great music, and it was awesome. And more importantly, I thought bringing in young listeners to the format, which is what I feel like, which has also been part of the struggle there, right? But then I also think that Luke and Jason Aldean brought a, longer, a younger group of listeners to the format who, who discovered Taylor and became fans of our format. Right. So back to this, obviously we've seen a lot of studies sort of hit just this week in terms of debunking the myth that females don't want to hear other females, and... I know that Chris Radio Disney has, has made a very, as you said, a very active plan based on research that you have seen that sort of the listeners demand that. So can you speak a little bit to that? I think it's also, like I mentioned before, you know, this is a goal that we set for ourselves, especially, you know, my boss, Phil, is the one that came up with Let the Girls Play. Something that no one really was doing out there is highlighting more the female artists that are out there. and. There's so many good female artists. When you think of, you you mentioned Ashley McBride, you know, Gabby Barrett. I don't know who was here uh, yesterday when she sang the national anthem. My gosh, you know, the list goes on and on. Lindsay L., Carly Pierce. I could sit here and just keep naming a bunch of artists that are incredible and they have streaming numbers. And you can see that, yeah, people do want to hear them. So that's one of the things we try to do is we don't wait till... Uh, Carly P Pierce hits, you know, 40 on the chart. If it's a good song, we're going to play it. I mean, there are a lot of metrics at everyone's disposal now, and I feel like that's one of the things, again, this music that's coming out now is really connecting because one of the arguments that's been made in the past is just that for whatever reason, it wasn't resonating with females. But I think that we're seeing, again, with all these records that are really connecting now and, and again, measurable by metrics that maybe we found our audience and maybe, you know, to Nate's point, the labels or the creative community for whatever reason maybe was not connecting those dots. I also feel like in some cases, you know, back to it being cyclical, it could be timing. I mean, we had, you know, a cleared on record in Tuxedo that got blasted by Sirius XM and, and, and peaked at 50 on the chart, but we sold 300,000 pieces. So it was clear that it was connecting. We just sort of couldn't 
galvanize the groundswell that we needed at terrestrial radio to sort of move it up the chart. And that's a, I mean, that's a tough putt there. So back to the scheduling sort of issue, obviously with the tweet of not being able to play, you know, females back to back. How does that factor into how you, obviously we know how you make your music decisions. You are all music people and again are evaluating metrics and, and going, I hope on gut, obviously, as we talked about, nobody wants a, you know, nobody wants a handout, right? We want to be, a, we want to be competitive based on the quality of the music, but how does that factor into how you schedule music? Uh, we don't have any rule. There is no female back-to-back -back rule. There is no any quarter hour rule. There's no rule in, in the, in music, in the scheduling. Same for all of you? Yeah, I mean, we don't have a rule either. Um, when we schedule music, we try to space all of our different styles of music that we play so the, 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 the full hour gives you a, a very good balance of, of who we are. But we play females back to back um, a lot. Um, and it sounds great. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's we, we uh, schedule and separate based by sound, not by gender and the texture of the music. Like, you know, I wouldn't play an Old Dominion after Sam Hunt. Wouldn't put George Strait next to Alan Jackson and so on. Again, like David said, just to give the consumer a, f a, a clear, full picture look of what the station's like in a, in a small capsule of time. It's, yeah, it, it's ridiculous not to play two females in a row. I mean, you know, why wouldn't you play Gone West following a Miranda Lambert and even some of the collaborations, we don't code the collaborations. So apparently Gilbert and Lindsay L, Lindsay L's not on the, the to kick it out anything else. Or like even Carrie Underwood and Keith Urban, the Carrie Underwood is on, on the fighter, it's a Keith Urban song. So even though it's even more of a duet, the, the, the secondary collaboration is not on that. Got it. And obviously, Chris, you have... Yeah, we don't have any rules. <laughs> no. <laughs> it would be logistically impossible to do so in terms of... Well, you know, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think for anyone that would have a rule like that, um, which I can't imagine someone actually having a rule, but if you did, one of the things I would encourage you to do is bring more female music that you feel is good into your music meeting and find a place you know, to add to your playlist. If one of the arguments has been sort of the unfamiliarity part of it, which is again, one of the things that we get told, what do you do to help outside of the obvious of playing it more? What else can you do from the radio standpoint to help sort of raise that familiarity about the artist and the song? Well, I think Johnny said something a little while ago about something that was true 30 years ago. Um, and I don't think there's any such thing as an unfamiliarity today. I think if you play an artist and identify who it is, especially if you're not talking after a new song, you're, I mean, I, I'm in a PPM market, I get it. But nonetheless, if you're not talking after a new song and identifying it, you're, you're missing what it's there for. But the fact of the matter is, if I say that we're playing a Kaylee Hammock song, you can go find everything you want to know about Kaylee Hammock in five seconds. Other songs, where she's from, what she, there's no such thing as unfamiliarity. If you play it and identify it, it will become familiar if they like it. That's a novel concept, huh? Radio. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that goes back to the, the sort of radio days of old, too, where the on-air talent was sort of your discovery tool. And, and when they said something, it, it was sort of vouching for it, right? Like they were passionate about something and you said, well, in that case, I have to go check that out. Well, it's all we have. It's all that separates us from, from as you said, a hundred other formats, or not formats, but things. I mean, we're, we're, we have this great idea, we have this product, we're gonna play a bunch of stuff you know, and we're gonna put 14 minutes an hour of commercials in it, and we want you to listen to it. Who would buy that? So if you're not discovering, if you're not telling people what's new and what's hot, it's, it's like you said, it's old school radio. It's the biggest thing in town. If you're the biggest thing in town and you're telling people what's cool and what's hot, they'll believe you. And then as you know, we bring them in live, and I'm sure you guys do the same thing, is, you, is you're playing something new, you bring them in live and expose it, and they become fans of the artist and fans of you. I feel that, and, and this was especially towards uh, the end of me being in terrestrial radio, I found it interesting because I would have my listeners coming up to me and saying, yeah, I really want to hear whatever artist's brand new song. And I'm like, well, we're playing it. No, they, that's already been out for six months. They're, they're new songs. So I don't think a majority of the our, uh, audience, especially the younger audience, uh, is getting new music from uh, radio. They're coming more for content. 
but it is still the jock's job to always, you know, hammer in who that artist is, do something unique with who the artist is, tell them something, you know, interesting about them, so. I was remiss not to do this before, so I'm gonna do it now. Obviously, if you have questions for any of the panelists, we invite you to submit them via the app. So uh, please do that. I'm sure that we've got a lot of people out there that would like to ask questions, and we'd love to have you involved in this conversation. And if you have somebody specific, panelist-wise, that you want to ask your question, please indicate that as well, so. I'd like to bring up just, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about airplay, and I, I do think that it's important, it, it's critical for labels to, to, we've talked about it a little bit, but for labels to sign more female artists. Um, if, if, if there's any chance that the radio groups, and there's been some discussions over the last few weeks about this with some of the groups, if the radio groups can make a commitment to playing more, we need, we need labels to sign more artists as well. Can you make that commitment? I, UMG is in, I can say that right now. So we actually, I, I will tell you honestly, we, at UMG, a third of our roster is female. I mean, and as far as I know, that's actually leading the standard right now. Now they are in you know, various stages of development, obviously. Um, and I think that's, been, that's actually part of it too, because the other thing is that you also don't wanna bring something to market that you don't think is ready. Yeah. And we've all had those issues where we've had maybe a song is connected or the song is right, but maybe the, the artist is not connecting for whatever reason. And I think we're all trying to be very mindful about that. I, I find one of the things interesting, I was talking to an actual female programmer yesterday who said to me, please don't bring me a female with a ballad. <laughs> And I thought well, that, that was interesting because do we feel like that females tend to launch on ballads? Because I, I, never, I never gave it thought before. Um, Mickey Guyton. I heard that song about an hour ago uh, at, the, at the Ryman. Um, I would play that tomorrow. As a matter of fact, I would play that today. <laughs> I've, never, I've, I've, never sh I've never been afraid of ballads. Um, I mean, Ingrid Andrus, Ingrid Andrus has a ballad out right now. It's going to be one of the biggest songs of the year. Um, I do think that we, as radio programmers, need to be concerned a little bit about tempo and make sure that the station isn't slow all the time, but I've never been afraid of a ballad. Um, so, Mickey Guyton. And I don't think it matters whether it's male or female. I think it's hard to launch an act on a ballad just because of, of from it, it doesn't make any difference. But when they do, and when, like the Ingrid Anders, which you just brought up, um, when it hits, it hits huge. And I would think that even with 30%, that some of your biggest actual revenue generating artists are the, part of that 30%, because when the, fe when the female artists hit, it's huge. Well, and I think that <clears throat> it, it's very interesting to me too, that tempo argument, or you know, back to the tweet, uh, if you saw Casey's, Casey Musgrave's reply was, well, but you can play 18 same sounding songs by a male back to back, so what's the issue there? And uh, I guess, is that sort of the tempo argument? Is that the, because I, I, I'll be honest, I've been, it's been told to me by programmers, if you're launching a female, it better be better than whatever else is on my desk. Well, I. I'm surprised you didn't punch them. I, I'm not saying I didn't. <laughs> I'm not saying I didn't. You have to remember, I'm five feet tall, so I'm more likely for a, a shin kick, but. Okay, well. Look, I've been in country now for 15 years, and it really wasn't until three, four years ago when I started noting this, noticing this phenomenon. A regional comes in with the CD, new music, and the first words out of his mouth was, this is tempo. Like, I never asked for that. Just give me a great song. And I, don't, I think I know why it happened that way, started happening that way, but it's our job as program directors to make sure the station sounds and flows correctly regardless of tempo. Just give us great songs and, and, and don't use tempo as a crutch. It's a lyric based format. Yeah. Play the, bring the best songs. I mean, look at their gold library. I think probably the f top five or 10 songs in the, in the gold library are ballads because they're great songs. Chris, have you noticed a particular type of, of music maybe that resonates more? Um, no, I also think it depends on, I do think there's something to be said with seasons. You know, when you're going into spring, you're wanting a little bit uh, more tempo. But, you know, when you look at, like, like Nate was saying, you know, we are 
a, a format based on lyrics. And that's one of the things in the country demo is our fans, our listeners can relate. They can relate to, they can relive that song. So I don't, I've never shied away from ballads, but it does go down to how you program your station, whether you're the music director or program director. Obviously, you don't want three down or Debbie songs back to back or three slow songs. The flow of the station has to go, you know, really well. I find that I think we're all sort of, especially in this world, I find that very few people are listening to only one format anymore. You know, we, we sort of live, Jennifer Nettle said this once, that we live in an iPod shuffle sort of world, right? Where it may be in the morning I'm listening to Lizzo and in the evening I'm listening to Lucy Silvis or whatever it may sort of be the case. So it's really fascinating to me that we have to, we sort of have to hit on all those facets. And ultimately, I think this format is better than any other in terms of gut punching you and eliciting that raw emotion. You know, you think about a song like The House That Built Me, which we'll talk about in a minute. And, you know, if you're a new artist coming with that song, because again, I can't tell you how many times I've made a phone call and say, hey, I've got, in the first question, is a temp, like cut off mid-sentence, is a tempo. Yeah. Well, my question is, does it make you feel something? Does it elicit a response? Does it make someone want to sort of tune back in? I mean. <coughs> well, and you just said this. It, it, the, the thing is that our format is so awesome because it is so diverse. I mean, you have every sound that you can find in an iPad in, in a different songs, and I think that's kind of how you have to make up your hour. If, if every song sounded the same, what good would it be? So that's, that's the diversity of this format. We've never splintered. It isn't like every other format that has three different versions. We have one. Well, and I think the reality is with, with again, females coming back on the radio, there's a real opportunity there, right? Because it is sounding unique. I mean, there are a lot of times where you can listen to a, a bunch of male tracks and you're not really sure who's who. To your point earlier, to all of our points, it's really tough to break a new artist regardless, yeah. right? But I think there's an opportunity there and, and you all are really sort of seizing that moment of going, this is how you can separate yourself sort of um, immediately, basically, from that pack. So um, we've got a few minutes left before we transition to sort of the industry side of things. I definitely want to get uh, each of your take in terms of artists you've supported or maybe some things that have surprised you, uh, some female artists. I mean, obviously, we can look at the chart now and see that things are popping, but uh, what you're excited about. But then I want to check in with Brent first to see if, Brent, do you have any uh, questions? Yeah, we actually got quite a few uh, really great questions. Uh, we'll start with this one. PDs, can you give a specific example of a female you have championed and how it paid off for your station? Um, well, there's the right, I mean, right now there's quite a few. I have a list here. Carly Pierce, Maren Morris, Kelsey Ballerini, Ingrid Andrus, Miranda Lambert, Gabby Barrett, Lindsay L, Carrie Underwood, Ashley McBride, Maddie and Tay, Mackenzie Porter, who's a brand new artist, and that Mickey Guyton song. Um, no, there's, I mean, that's just a few that we're playing right now. Um, I, I just, yeah, there's a lot of great stuff right now. That's the old one. He's talking about the new one. All right, I'm going to download that right now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so, so uh, for KLB uh, over the last few years, that's, that's a list. I, I would, I, I mean, our, my list would probably be similar. We were really, really early on, on, Jen Wayne's bands, Back to Stealing, Angels Now, Runaway June, and it's great to see them doing what they're doing. Um, I think it's a shame that Lindsay L has been out since 2014, and her first hit was with Brantley Gilbert, and, and then she comes out with, in my opinion, the best thing she's ever done, and it, it, it can't even get inside the top 60. It's a damn shame, and when people have hits, my pet peeve, when people have hits and you don't go play the next one, shame on you. Um, I mean, that's how we build artists. It's how we build stars. It's how we build this damn format. I mean, Luke Bryan had a second single once, too, um, which didn't work, by the way. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, Ashley McBride already mentioned because we had the great luck to have her in the club four days after she did the ACMs last year, and it sold 1,000 tickets in three days. Um, uh, did I say Lauren Elena? No, Lauren didn't. Elena has been, has been, I mean, Lauren Elena had, uh, just like Gabby Barrett, had a great kickoff on a, on a TV show. They come with fans, and she's been nothing but amazing for us. We played an album track called Three that should have been a hit, and it was, we're still playing it. It's, it's anyway, it's just a special song. Can I, can I, before, just sorry, because I forgot to mention Lauren Elena. 
If you're not playing her new single right now, I mean, get your ears checked. It's a smash. It's a, tr it's a smash. It's, it's everything we look for in an artist and not a female artist. It's everything we look for in an artist. So to add to your list, because we are playing all of those and above, and Lauren Elena, great song. I believe we have it in heavy right now. Uh, one of the artists, all of those we've supported, um, you know, Casey, Kelsey, uh, Runaway June, Lindsay L, we are playing her new one, love it, Carly Pierce. Um, but a good example for us would be Gabby Barrett because she also was our MBT for not only, you know, we have Radio Disney Country, but she was the MBT for Radio Disney, which is the next big thing. And I had to write it down, but uh, she had over 2.7 million impressions uh, and then 44 engagement, or 44, sorry, thousand engagements. And we are on her third song right now, playing her on the radio, so. Fantastic. Johnny, do you have oh, anything? Me. <laughs> Well, I'll, 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 just be, I'll just be rehashing everyone's list. Uh, it, my favorite song right now is the Lindsay L, okay? Uh, but, it, it, but it's a great song, exactly. period. So it, it speaks to you, it has a message, and it, it, it tweaks your ear. It makes you stop and listen. That's what it's all about. But, you know, insta instead of going through all, all the different artists, but there are two particular moments that I'm real proud of, and they both happen to involve female uh, artists, I'm real proud of that, the way I helped break the band Perry when it first came out. And I think I was maybe, we were maybe one of, one of the small handful of stations that play every single Casey Musgraves release. I did too. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, there's, that's probably why we're on this panel, I think. <laughs> I know we have a couple minutes before we have to uh, switch panelists. Um, we'll ask this question. How much of the country music professional industry is made of women, and how can you as leaders on the panel here help that? I'm going to jump in right here, too, because Chris and I were talking about this. When I first moved to town back in the mid-'90s, uh, promotion was... Women didn't do promotion. Women were publicists. I mean, it was very rare, and I think that the, you can see this reflected in the workplace. My regional staff, all female. And it's not that they're all female, they're all badasses. They just happen to all be female. But the reality is, is that you're seeing that sort of happen. We have more female PDs than we've had in the past. It's really reflecting the actual workplace overall, I think. And again, this is why when people want to say to me that women don't want to hear women, I'm like, the hell? <laughs> right. And I know for myself, growing up in a radio family, I never really saw many you know, female PDs or music directors, so it was kind of hard to be like, Who's my mentor? Who do I find? So, but now you're right, there is a lot more. So hopefully there'll be even more. Yeah, I mean, uh, with, with Beasley, uh, our CEO, Carol Ann Beasley, um, is, a, is a woman, obviously. My market manager in Boston, Mary Mena, I think she's here. Our, our GSM is a woman. My music director, marketing director, Don Santalicito, is, a, is obviously a woman. Um, many of our on-air folks are female, so, um, yeah, KLB were well represented with women, and I think that's important. I am, I'm the token male. <laughs> our, whole, our whole staff is female. Uh, program director, general sales manager, promotions director, operations manager. All right. Let's see. If we have time for one more question. Uh, why do you think that stations are reluctant to play women like Casey Musgraves, Mickey Guyton, and Ashley McBride, to name a few, even though many of them have streaming numbers to back them up from a desire consumer-wise? Well, that's, I think, the, I that's I why think we're we here. That. I mean, I think, I think we've, all, I, we've all played Casey. Uh, we've all, we're all playing, at, well, we're playing Ashley McBride. I think we've covered that. Um, I think the best song wins. And sometimes, I mean, Miranda made an amazing record, the last record before this, and even she admitted here yesterday it wasn't chock full of hits. Sometimes that happens. And that's the record she wanted to make. So we are in the business of playing hits. I think we, some, we sometimes talk about what the market will bear again, and I feel like that that's one of the challenges that we all have um, is whether or not we are sort of challenging the audience to some degree to sort of get outside of that comfort zone as well. By the way, Bluebird is a hit. 
Absolutely, Bluebird's a hit. Yes, I agree. And if you haven't heard Tequila Does, you need to. <laughs> Well, thank you again. These are all advocates. These are all people that are affecting change in a positive way and are, are partners and, are, as we like to say, part of the solution. So thank you all. And we're going to now transition. Round of applause for Nate, David, Johnny, and Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. And now we're going to transition to sort of the uh, industry part of things where we're going to hear from uh, Marianne Kraft, who runs Shopkeeper Management, Damon Moberly from Mercury Records and Emily from Amazon. So if you guys would like to make your way up to the stage, we'll get started with round two. Again, great time to remind you that if you have questions for the panelists, please submit those via the app uh, and specify which panelist you would like to direct your question. Showtime. Come on. <laughs> Welcome, Emily. <laughs> Marianne and Damon. Hi, everyone. All right, we ready? Are we on? Do the yes. female panel. What could go wrong, they said. <laughs> It'll be fun, they said. It'll be fun, they said. Well, Emily, we'll start with you since you're right okay. here. <laughs> Great. Um, because one of the things that we, again, as, as sort of label folks, I, it's been interesting to see that there almost seem to be sort of differing patterns in terms of what the market will bear for streaming. So if you want to talk a little bit about best practices, about things that you have seen that, again, sort of debunk the myth that females don't want to hear females. Well, women, you know, women do want to hear women. We see it on our service. Um, you know, what's been really great to see is on Amazon Music, through Alexa and the Echo, our customers are actively asking for female artists, which is amazing. Um, from July 2019 to about January of this year, we saw almost a 60% growth in requests for female artists. And specifically, during that time frame, we saw 65% growth in monthly requests for uh, Randa Lambert specifically. So it's really great to see our customers actively you know, asking for female country artists. And that's really an indicator of passion, right? It is an indicator of passion. I mean, with the ease of voice, it's, in, it's incredible, you know, just you can ask Alexa to play country music or play Miranda Lambert and music starts for you automatically, which is awesome. Um, and also we've seen virtually, you know, no data that suggests that women are getting skipped on our service more than male artists. That was my question because I, I know that's one thing that has definitely come up. In country yes. music, obviously, I can speak to right, that, that, but sure. yeah. Fantastic. Damon, you've obviously had, not to skip you, Maran, but I, I feel like you should revel in the fact that uh, Miranda's been, you know, 60% increase there, so. That's good news. We're very grateful to Amazon. <laughs> well, we're, we're grateful for Miranda Lambert in general in life. So, Actually, I, I do want to start with uh, Miranda because it was not until her third album that she had her first number one. So obviously the radio was a little bit of a slow going, not that there wasn't chart success, but really trying to connect those dots to that mass level. So as her manager, what were you sort of doing to sort of build that fan base while those dots were being connected? Uh, well, the good news is she came out of a TV show which had kind of a big audience. Um, and we were lucky because a lot of pe uh, TV people were embracing her, her art, uh, and she was great live. So we, as we were trying to get radio, because in truth is radio does make everything better. It makes the show better when the people hear the artists on the radio. Um, so every artist is going to want to be played at radio. I remember Miranda calling me the first time she was played at radio, and it was a huge deal. Uh, but I would say the first four years, we started in 2004, and it took about four years for her to be in the top ten. Um, at the time, Gunpowder and Lead was a top eight song, and I think in 2008, there was three women in the top ten. It was Carrie Underwood, Taylor Swift, and Miranda Lambert. And each of these ladies had one song in the top 10. So when you think about that, that it literally took us four years to even get to the top 10, even in those days. So it feels a little bit redundant that 15 years later, we're still having this conversation. But here we are. Um, and then, lo and behold, it took us another two years to get a number one and barely. And whoever was here yesterday for Miranda's talk, it literally, she engaged about 15 people while she was on tour with Brad Paisley to call radio stations on a Saturday 
to try to make it to a number one. She was like, I have to have this number one. And there is a funny sort of side story, since we're all being serious, but I think sometimes looking a little bit behind the scenes, and for you guys in the room to also know how much this matters to our artists that you guys are playing them, whether they're female or a male or a band or whatever they are, they are, they are that's their way to get heard by their fans. That's their opportunity to go out on tours. Uh, because if their music isn't heard, we can't sell any tickets. We can't sell any tickets, they won't be touring. So it affects their entire career. Um, but I remember Miranda calling me probably about a month before White Liar went number one. And it was midnight and she is, you know, she never calls after eight or nine unless it's an emergency. And she apologized for calling me that late. And she said, hey, so if we get a number one, I have an idea for a number one party because it was her first one, and I said, well, you know, okay, what is it? And she explained it to me. And as we were going through it, at about 30 minutes later, I did say to her, well, there is a chance this might not make it to number one. I'm just saying, it's a great party idea, but what are we gonna do? She goes, well, just celebrate a number two. <laughs> and the reason why I'm bringing this up is, you know, I feel like a little bit whether it's us as managers or record labels or whoever it is, um, we sometimes pressure for every song to be a number one because that's sort of the be all end all. But I think in our world, yes, we had TV that sort of helped us, but we also were really much more interested in building a catalog for live performances. And what I mean with that is we were interested in building songs that the fans know. And it doesn't require it to be a number one, as we learned with Gunpowder and Lead being a number eight. Uh, you know, and there's so many songs I could name here that all you all probably don't remember what chart number it was. But to the fans, all these songs in her catalog are number ones. And I think we need to remember that not every song needs to get to that pinnacle. And I think that's important. I can tell you that every promotion person knows exactly where a song peaked. <laughs> Burn in our brain. In fact, Damon, this is a good segue because you've obviously been instrumental in careers from everyone from Sugarland to Shania to Lauren Elena, but uh, Luke Lewis actually had a piece of advice about Sugarland's baby girl, if you remember that. Remind me, I'm old. <laughs> he said he'd rather have a six week number two than a number one that sits there for one week and goes down in flames. Yeah, look, that's the life that we live, right? As promotion people and working you guys to death to try to get uh, songs to number one. I want to make one point real quickly about the previous panel and the panelists who were here. We had like three of the top five new music guys on, on the stage. It might be interesting to hear from somebody who works for an OM or a radio company that feels like a 24 song playlist is what's best for ratings. So it, just an altering opinion, these guys are the best, right? They, they play tons of music, they expose women, but not everybody has that opportunity. So uh, anyway, yes, uh, been around a long time, worked with Shania Twain, and look, all the Shania songs weren't number ones. We'd get to, to number 10 on the chart with a song from Come On Over and drop a new one. And they were crossing at 20 on the chart, but we were selling records like it, they, you couldn't print them fast enough. Different time, obviously, but now we're finding with the new services that when things get exposed and they're on the radio, those are those are ripping it up. Gabby Barrett's numbers are huge, right? Well, I think that's been part of it too. Is that we we feel like the rising tide lifts all boats. And again, if we're doing number one song this week had I think 38 million audience impressions. I mean, nobody, to your point, for tickets or no one wants to deny that exposure. We all want that exposure. And again, it drives streams. What we've noticed, obviously, on our side of things, is that. The more the song moves up the charts, streams increase, tickets increase, all of that. It's all about building an artist, effectively, and building a superstar. Right, and one of the frustrating parts for me in the promotion side is that I think with our women especially, and the new women, is that we got to get out of this layaway program. We, we, we're good at getting them added. Lauren Lena had 50 ads on Getting Good coming off of Dancing with the Stars, and it took us 13 weeks to get it on the chart. That's frustrating. That's, that's a really frustrating uh, portion of what we do. We've got relationship enough, or Lauren's worked hard enough and has relationship with radio stations to get it on, or they see the value in the song, and then we're, you know, the layaway three spin overnights for 12 weeks. I think a lot of that is identifying. We have so many metrics at our disposal right now is trying to identify things that work quickly, and that's where I think in the streaming space you see something immediately. We do. I mean, I think there's. we look at a lot of different data points. People tend to get hung up on skip rates, but there's a lot of stuff we look at. I think first and foremost, you know, for me, when I'm programming, it really 
starts with the music? Is the music good? Um, regardless of what's sort of gone into that, is this something I really want to champion and promote on our playlists and stations? And then, you know, we're sort of looking at completion rates, ads, so what the customer do after they heard the song or while they're listening to the song. Obviously, skip rates are a part of that. But we're also looking at, you know, an artist or a song more holistically. So what else is happening to them in the market that is sort of driving people to come to Amazon Music? Are they on tour? Do they have television appearances? Um, how are they engaging with their fans and socials? So I think all of that, you know, completes a story. And then it's like, great, let's propel this forward or we learn when to propel it forward. But yeah, we're constantly looking at data and information. I think it's building that awareness. I mean, Marianne, to your sort of point about what you were doing with Miranda leading into that sort of being somewhat of an automatic, right, at radio. Right. I mean, also, I think sometimes we need to remember that very few careers get built in a short amount of time. Even our own careers take time, 15, 20 years. I mean, just listening to you, you didn't get here yesterday. So I think sometimes also we're dealing with artists that think that because Florida Georgia Line developed so quickly or before because Taylor Swift developed so quickly that every artist's career should happen overnight. But the truth is it takes time and that's why in this town they always say it's a 10 year town. And that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that because what else are these artists gonna do other than keep getting better at their craft, keep writing better songs, keep getting better exposure. So I mean it is our job really as managers or even as record labels to sort of work with these expectations as well. And you know, also work with our artists to not constantly compare themselves to others. You know, I think, um, I remember doing a panel one day at ASCAP as a friend of mine asked me, and there was 10 women in the room, and they were addressing exactly this problem. They were asking, well, it's a really hard time because women don't get played at radio. And I said, well, you should look at that as an opportunity. That means there is a lot of room for all of you to get played. So I think it's a little bit also outlook of, you know, we could have been frustrated years ago, and trust me, it was kind of frustrating for me that we couldn't get any of Miranda's songs from Weight of These Wings played, especially a Tin Man. I think it's a huge hit. Um, and, but you know what? You can't hang on to the ones that don't work. You kind of just go, okay, you didn't like this one? How about that one? How about that one? And I think that's sort of the perseverance that we sort of stuck with and I knew I had a great artist and she was hard working. And I think that's kind of the recipe. You just kind of got to keep going. I think that's kind of where it's at. We've always been really fearful of putting a single out, especially with females and having it fail. We stay in so long because of that particular thought of, well, if that's not a hit, then we get put in the penalty box the next time. And Lauren Lane is going to keep making great music. And Maddie and Tay came out with Friends Don't. And you know what? We got up the chart a bit. Uh, we couldn't get everybody in at the same time, but now that you got one that's out testing 27 songs ahead of it on the chart, uh, you know, it, it, it's gonna take a minute, right? It's gonna take a minute, but when you've got one that you know, we're, we're, we're afraid to get off of them because of what it may do penalty box-wise on the next single. Well, and that's what we've talked about that a lot from the label standpoint of the failing faster idea. Feeling we're succeeding, frankly, to that matter faster, but I think the other thing is that you know, in pop, there tends to be a tendency of put the song out, it doesn't work, it's gone. And obviously this format is one that's built on artistry. This is one where we have artists that have, you know, 30, 40, 50 year careers if they play it right. And I think that getting out of that mentality, to your point, Damon, of the penalty box if this one doesn't work, but to know that the artist is in there. Because the reality is, artist accessibility in this format is unlike any other format. You know, we have... And listen, that's why we've got so many programmers from other formats that come here and stay here, because yeah. of the accessibility. Their ability to have the artists come to their radio stations or do a guitar pool. It's beautiful, and it doesn't happen anywhere else. Yeah, I, I mean, it truly is a family, and that's the everyone's vested in that long-term career. But I want you to speak to a little bit to the label, label side of things in terms of that development and, and rolling artists out. I mean, I know that there's a perception. We hear a lot of times when we're introducing a new artist of, oh, that, that star, got that star quality. And... Not a loaded question, but it does well, feel like it's okay. I can speak. Let's, if you could take one step off the female track, right? When we rolled Stapleton around the radio in 2013, I, I guys said, "I don't know what to do with this guy," and clearly, it took us a few years to get to the CMAs when it exploded. And now, it, you know, we, we he's making a new record, and we want to have the airplay, like Marion said, but. People said we don't know what to do with that. Ultimately, that star quality and star factor, Shania Twain, came in visually and sonically so different that it couldn't be ignored. You couldn't get away from that. They had to play it, right? They figured out a way to get it on. 
um, Lauren Lane has got relationships with the artist, I mean, with the, the audience, and she connects on a human level, and she's great with radio stations when she comes in and does everything they need her to do. They're working really hard, right? But there is something. I mean, it, here's a great analogy. There are millions of golfers in the United States that play recreationally, right? A couple times a month. There are 150 of them that get a tour card. And our format's not that much different. There are so many spaces on a playlist, so you got to stand out. you got to be different enough or solid enough that you grab people's attention and they say, oh, that's special. I mean, it's got to be great. Material's got to be great. We hear that from programmers. Like, I, I had a lot of conversations about this panel and asked guys, okay, so this female conversations and tomatoes and all that, what do, you know, how do we get away from that or why is it? And people say, well, the material's certainly got to be there. But we've got great songs right now. Maren Morris came out with a, a debut single, went right to number one, and she's becoming a superstar in the format, right? It's got to be great. Well, I think the investment has to be there, obviously, from the artist standpoint. Again, there is a, an element of that you don't give up on something. Even You know that you're building the base. You know that we're getting there and, and trying to sort of exercise patience. And that's got to be tough, Marianne, to your point. It's got to be tough for the artist and for the manager to sort of bear that out when, you know, when, when we're having to make a phone call on a Monday and say, it doesn't look like it's going to go, but we believe and we're staying with it. That's a tough one. <laughs> well, you know, I think, I, I know there's a lot of programmers in this room, and I think uh, you are absolutely right. The three gentlemen that were here before and the lady, they have a lot of autonomy in programming what they want to program. Uh, Miranda, when she left the stage yesterday, she said something that actually made me super happy because she said, listen and play what makes you happy. And you know, what we do need in, in the world of radio is we need more shepherds. We need less sheep. And I think... <laughs> and I think you all have an opportunity to kind of make this change, like David and all, and Nate, and, and Johnny were saying, you have an opportunity to make this change because this change... You know, they were saying, we don't want to be treated better. Actually, we do want to be treated better for just this year. And starting next year, you can treat us the same. But right now, we want to be treated better because we have come a long way. We're still here. We're still battling it. And we belong in this format. And if you guys don't have these great females in your format anymore, you're going to be sad because you're not going to have really great voices to put in between all the advertising that you are putting out there. So, and just know this one thing, and, and Amazon is an example, and we have lots of other great streaming service. I don't wanna just say one, because I know I'll get in trouble for not mentioning the others, but we all know the others. The fan goes where they play the music that they wanna hear. So don't ignore the fan, because they are your bread and butter, like they are our bread and butter. So just know, if you guys don't, give them what they want. They have places to go now. That's fair. Um, <clears throat> Damon, back to, again, you've had a lot of success over the years with various artists. Do you find a common thread in terms of what sort of helps a female break? Oh, gosh. Um, great songs. You know, <laughs> Baby Girl was a number two, and nobody remembers that it was a number two. It was a giant smash for, for Sugar Land. And then she won Song of the Year with Stay, which she wrote by herself, and you all played the crap out of that song. And they said, you'll never get it played, no drums, no bass. You know what, hit records make it on the radio ultimately, but there are times when you're gonna need to give something a shot. Uh, I, we have plenty of females at Universal that I can talk about, right? But if you're not playing Ashley McBride, somebody said it, I, there's not much better. And I remember at the CMA, she, you know, she won, I think, Best New Female, and there was all this conversation about, ah, I gotta get on that, and guys still aren't on it. So if you love, look, you're not gonna love it all. You can't play it all, but if you find a female record that you love or a record that you love, you gotta be a champion. You gotta go. And then ultimately, a hit record is gonna raise its hand. I mean, again, that's the struggle with all of us when we feel like something that we believe in doesn't work, but. Uh, but it is getting better. I mean, look, it's difficult, and this conversation's been going on for five years, but with programs like CMA's Kickstarter and the next Women of Country, and you, you've had on the verge artists, you know, female, they split the last one uh, with two females, right? So it's, it's gotten somewhat better. I just, we just need, for it to be a further investment and to continue to be so for females. Well, it does feel like the tide is shifting a little bit. Now, Marianne, you also have a new artist that Crystal is managing in, Tennille Town. So I'm curious as to okay. the signing process, obviously, especially knowing that when 
Tamil got signed, we were probably in still some of that down cycle in terms of not a lot of females getting signed. So what was that process like? Uh, well, the good news, so I have a company called Shopkeeper and I have an amazing artist manager at my company called Tris Crystal Dishman. She's unbelievable. She's been with me for 10 years. She was Miranda's day to day. And her and I actually go way back where, um, I don't know how many of this room knows, but I used to be the day to day manager for the Dixie Chicks during the good, the bad, and the ugly days. So uh, even in those days, Crystal worked for me in the Nashville office, which was 2001, so it's a long time ago. Um, but Crystal ha came to me with this passion for this artist called Tennille Towns, and once she played me the music, it's amazing. Um, and by the time uh, Tennille was signed to Shopkeeper and to Crystal as her manager, uh, she was already signed to Sony. So that actually happened before us, so I really can't speak to that process. But the interesting part, and this is something that we're dealing with in our format too, is we have a lot of artists in this town that deserve great management, but they all wanna be signed by the same five, six people because they feel like that's who they need to be with. And I knew Crystal is an amazing manager, and I think sometimes, just like you guys need to give young new female artists a chance, you know, publishers and record labels need to give young female managers a chance. And I think it's our job as management companies to help groom that, whether it's a, a woman manager or a male manager, but we need better young managers to help manage these amazing artists. So I'm thrilled, Tennille's doing amazing. Um, you know, we are struggling at radio, but we're kind of used to that a little bit, so it's not feeling as bad. But I feel like we're gonna go with the same system. We're just gonna give you guys songs that hopefully at some point you'll hear a song that you feel like you wanna jump in on because this artist is not going away. Crystal is continuing to sort of build a legacy with this amazing artist. And you know, I just, it's gonna take some time and we're, we're gonna wait it out and we're just gonna keep going until she gets to that place, so. And just to chime in, holding out for the one is a banger like immediately with Tennille. And I think with us too, um, I was fortunate enough, Crystal brought me to a show of hers at the Bluebird and was completely blown away. And you know, last year on Amazon Music, we worked with Tennille a lot because I was just like, this is a talent, this is an artist that just needs to be heard and our customers need to hear her. Um, and so we had her be a part of our Weekly One program, which is a developing artist program um, where we put all of our sort of marketing and programming and you know power behind a developing artist to really get them heard by our customers and out in the general music marketplace, um, which is really successful. And we also did an Amazon original track with her. She covered Stupid Boy, the Keith Urban song, which was amazing, which has now ended up on her recent EP that's come out. Um, and she was part of our artist to watch list for 2019 as well, which is a cross genre list we released in January. So, you know, I think we're just really thrilled. That's sort of what I live for is really getting behind developing artists and doing whatever we can to prop them up, especially when they have music as great as Tennille's. That's, again, it's making that investment, right? You, you, you pick your horses effectively and you go and go and go and go. I'm curious as to how much the impact of sort of visuals and so social media now, um, you know, you go back to the, 70s and before the advent of MTV, you know, a lot of times people that were listening to the radio had no idea what artists looked like unless you went to a show. And I think that goes back to that maybe star argument that sometimes that, that we get. So how much is that factored into sort of the development process and, and what that perception is at radio and with the, with the listeners, do we think? Do we think that females are harder on females? Do we, uh, I had someone tell me last night who works at a radio station, I, they had been to a showcase yesterday and said we saw lots of great stuff and I found myself being more critical of the two women that were on the show. I, mean, I don't know that that happens across the board and I, I, don't, I don't think so, but is that, is that a thing? Me, for me personally, no. <laughs> no, no, not a thing. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's maybe a thing in some areas or in some worlds, but at my company, I only have women working with me, not because we don't like men, we love men, <laughs> uh, but they just happen to be better for those particular jobs that I needed filled. So, um, you know, I think, I think especially in this town, I think the earlier panel talked a little bit about executives, women executives, and the good news is when I first came to this town in the late 90s, 
I was the only female manager at Sony Records, and I'd look around, and there was 25 managers that were men. And I didn't have a lot of women to look up to. There were some uh, in LA that are great, and they still are great. But in this town, the good news is there are so many amazing female managers now. And when you look at some of the biggest stars are managed by women. My good friend Ann Edelblut manages Carrie Underwood, Carrie Edwards, um, Virginia Davis, Thomas Rhett, Luke Bryan, obviously by Carrie. The list goes on and on. I mean, there is, women are doing an amazing job managing artists, no matter whether they're women artists, men artists, bands, young people, old people, it doesn't matter. They persevere in this town, and I think, you know, it, I, I love seeing that, and I think it's a very supportive environment for that type of thing. Yeah, I feel like that there's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a misnomer there that women don't support other women. I mean, I feel like that we're all here to champion each other. Um, and again, very supportive. Uh, again, at Universal, we are, we have, a, I would say, for pound for pound, probably more female executives and more female employees maybe than any other label. And it's a very supportive environment. We're all trying to challenge each other and do better. And there is a little bit of a different sensibility, and it's not a bad thing at all. I mean, obviously, Damon and I work very closely together. And you know, we're, we're brother and sister in the same group, but he also knows- Trade artists Monday. back and forth. Absolutely, yeah, exactly. But you know, on Monday, I wanna beat him, <laughs> you know, when it's in, on the ad board, and that's kind of the relationship that we have, and it's a good symbiotic kind of thing, and I feel like that there has been a little bit of that. I'm sure that there are sort of females that are that way, but the reality is is that we all have too much to do right now. We're all trying to, to work toward a common goal of breaking, breaking artists, breaking female artists, breaking artists overall, and the reality is is that if we don't sort of work together and put that aside, we're not gonna get anywhere, you know? Um, looking for questions for Brent, if we have anything that we want to throw in here. Oh, I got him running. Sorry about that. <laughs> Again, if you have any, please submit them via the app, and uh, Brent, we'll throw to you. All right. Do you feel that the way labels brand women in today's industry has a direct impact on their airplay stats, specifically type of songs they release, uh, imaging in media, FaceTime, et cetera? We're gonna go with the best song, I think, every time. Look, we didn't put three out as a single. Nate spoke to that a few minutes ago. They played it and made it a hit in San Jose. We were scared to death of the tempo. That's a fact. I, I, no, I don't, I don't know that we put them in a hole as, as far as their imaging is concerned. A lot of times the artists these days are in control of a lot of that themselves, right? I mean, they have an idea of where they want to go. So no, I, I don't believe we, we're not handicapping, I don't think. For this, it says for Katie, but it's, it's a label question, so for Damon as well. What impact do you feel the major chains have on female airplay? <laughs> I'll follow behind you. Yeah, you, you lead the way, little one. I see how you are. Uh, the short answer is a big one. I mean, obviously, again, I, I referenced Claire Dunn earlier. If we had had a sort of national platform, we'd be talking about a platinum single instead of one that sold 300,000. So again, you'll not find any promotion person in town that would turn down chain-wide airplay on a record. And again, that's an exposure. Once it gets to a certain point, again, it is gonna have to perform on its own, but what we're trying to do is get to that point. We talked about it earlier. We don't want to be buried in the overnights for six months. Um, I would love nothing. I mean, we advocate for those things. We just, we need to know. You know, we, again, it doesn't behoove us or radio to stay in records that don't work. And we're trying to figure out if we have a connection. The only way we know that is to get airplay. And the chain uh, programs are huge for the growth of a record. If you've got a Lauren that's been out for 14 or 16 weeks and you, you pick something up from my heart, it, it, it just propels you up the chart to such a degree that they are important and we have to have them at some point before it gets too long in the tooth. It matters big time. Absolutely, and again, it just, it's an indicator and you know faster, right? Uh, and there have been some really great champions. I mean, I, we've, we've talked, obviously, the people that we had up here before are all champions. Rod Phillips has been a champion. Bobby Bones has been a champion. There have been a lot of these people that have really sort of said, we want to make this a priority. And, and then again, the record's going to have to perform. So, and that's all we can ask, honestly. Question for Marianne. Do you feel there is more pressure for women to write their own songs than men? Um, no, actually I don't. Um, I feel like, you know, the best song should win. It kind of goes back to the same old thing. It all began with a song. And I think some artists feel like they need to write their song, but I think, it goes back to, if it's not good, then don't go out with it. Because at the end of the day, not every song that's written, not every song that's on the record is the best song or should be at radio. 
So I don't, I don't feel, with my artists, I don't feel that pressure, and especially my artist, uh, she doesn't feel that pressure because a lot of times she covers other people's songs, and obviously one of the biggest songs of her career was not written by her, House That Built Me, which was a four-week number one in 2010. So, um, so I don't feel that pressure, nope. For the panel, in your opinion, who is an artist everyone should be paying attention to? Tinniel Towns. <laughs> She's not mine, but Ashton McBride, I'm a huge fan. Okay, fine. Gabby Barrett. Sorry, I'm gonna have to be selfish here, and I'm, I'm really excited about the new music we just got from Cassie Ashton. So I, I feel like that's been another one where we have not necessarily been able to connect the dots as of yet. But well, you we, will. We, but we see that, that is, it's there. There is big there. We just have to be able to sort of get into a position where we can get to the masses effectively. Are you saying Cassie Ashton? Yep. I'm a huge fan of Cassie Ashton's. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about her because um, you mentioned earlier CMA Kickstart program. Uh, I'm on the CMA board and I was actually the person who birthed that program with my very good friend, Mary Hilliard Harrington, who I forgot to mention as another brilliant female artist manager partner in crime, so her and I kind of came up with this program because we felt like younger artists needed another level of support. Um, and since we were on the same May board and we wanted to kind of just create something, and I have to say our first year and our first three candidates, Kathy Ashton was one of them, and I, would, I couldn't have been more happy that she was, and I got to know her, and she is just so artistic and full of life, and if you have any chance to spend any time with her, please do. Uh, and it's just there, it, it, and I love that she says she's a singer with a singer because she knows how to sew. And I sew, so we have that in common. Um, and she's just so interesting. And there are so many stories in her. And uh, anyhow, I'm super proud of her journey. I'm so excited that you guys as a record label are supporting that. So super happy that, you know, She's doing as well as she's doing. And there's a lot of development discussion there too, right? So you, you went out, you, 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 uh, she made records, she made songs, you did showcases, and you all didn't have one that you felt was a home run, so you waited, right? You're developing the artist. Well, I think that we were getting the music out there. I think one of the things we, you know, talking earlier about, it it's all goes back to the song. A lot of these success stories that we're talking about are people that are artists, right? There are a lot of great singers in this town, male and female, right? someone that has a sense of artistry, like Cassie does, like a Casey Musgraves, like a lot of these people, like a Miranda, like all these people that we're talking about, I mean, that's next level. They know who they are. They're going to be who they are. And it's almost like we have to get the people to come to them, right? Because they're not going to serve up something that's just sort of digestible and whatever else. I mean, it is art. And again, we are just trying to figure out the way that we can get that music to everyone. Obviously, back to this point, you know, we've put songs out at DSPs, we've put videos out, we're sort of building that fan base, but, but, but we know that radio needs to be a big driver there too. So again, it's gotta be all of these pieces of the puzzle. It's not one thing, right? We're relying, if we're building a superstar, you need all things firing on all cylinders. Well, so. and it's exciting too to see when you do put one out, you haven't, maybe you haven't shipped it. This morning you talked about Parker McCollum. Song's not been shipped to radio and it's 15 million streams already. There's a story building, right? The DSPs are helping with that. They, they can find it, they can play it. That's a great start, it's a great on-ramp, right? But we, we've got to have radio airplay as well to, to, to round the whole thing out. Do you want to work all my records while you're up here? I'm happy to. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the other good news I just realized. Uh, so you guys are actually playing the other two Kickstart artists, Travis Denning and James Rogers. They were also part of our program for the first year. So the good news is younger artists are getting traction and radio is starting to embrace it. So thank you for that. And the money that, that you all, well, that the program invested in these, all these new artists that have been, you know, lucky enough to, to have it, it's gigantic, the looks that they get. Travis got to perform on the big stage at the CMA Fest, a song like those sort of things are really hard to get. So you guys have taken the initiative to make something happen. It's, it's a big benefit. It's just, we're, there's so much, Everyone has so much sort of like vying for their time, right? And I think that's been the thing is to try to educate the consumer who these artists are via DSPs, via videos. I mean, that's that's been really the trick, I think, for all of us. Especially with new artists. I mean, I think we all are heavily invested in developing new artists, you know, regardless of gender, just because we won't have careers right. if they don't 
become more successful. So it's where we were, you know, I think Cassie, Travis, Jameson have all been weekly one artists with us. So definitely commitment from us in terms of support for developing and um, it's been a real pleasure to support them and we're always looking for that. I think as programmers, we're on the front lines. We wanna hear the music first. Um, we wanna get that music to our customers, you know, because we really believe in it and we feel they will too. Like if you like Luke Bryan, you probably like Travis Denning. And well, it goes back to having some more things in the marketplace too, right? Because if you if something sort of strikes you, you wanna then dive in and learn all about and sort of consume whatever you could consume in whatever form. So. Um, that's what's been really great about having things like Amazon. Yeah, and I think, you know, artists more so now than ever are putting out more music more often. And so it's been really great where it's like, well, you know, their single might be on Country Heat, which is our global uh, country playlist, but then on Fresh Country, it's, you know, their newest song that they just put out. And we're like maybe trying to see if that should be the new single. Like, we just want to be supportive of great music and, you know, find homes for all of it because we know our customers want to hear it. And that goes back to the life cycle of how long we're working songs at country radio versus, you know, an audience that may discover it on Amazon. And, and, you know, that life cycle may be half the time it takes for us to get a song all the way up the chart. So, again, it's more important for us to, A, build that artist profile as part of the development. And then, you know, again, make sure that we're, we're feeding that to the consumers effectively. Brent, we have any more questions back there? That's it? Here's a really good thing about what's happening right now. There's a lot of really great music coming out this year. You got a new Sam Hunt dropping. You got a Chris Stapleton in the studio making a new record. I'm speaking about Universal. But the music's getting really good right now. And I think that's a benefit for country radio. I do feel like that's been part of it, too, is the cycle. Just, again, where, again, when we're having these discussions about females, I, I mean, I love listening to music by females. I just, I always have. That's what got me into country. It was when I was at my dorm room at Appalachian State, I was reading Music Row. I was listening to Patty and Trisha and Reba and all of it. And I can remember delivering packages to the MCA office on Music Circle going, gosh, someday I hope I get to work there. You know what I mean? So I understand that then, you know, you sort of go away for that. But then I also feel like it's going to come back around. And so when people are asking this question, I'm very optimistic. I'm thrilled. I'm so excited that Gabby Barrett is connecting. I'm so excited that Ingrid Andrus has a song that punches you right in the gut and makes people want to go consume it. I mean, I just feel like those voices are there and they're speaking and they're connecting and that's going to be great for all of us. I mean, this is going to be a great music year and I'm really excited about where we're headed. Um, I want to add something else. Before I started in country music, I worked in rock and pop and R&B. And when I started in country music, one of the things that meant the most to me is the community feel and Nashville as a whole and the the part you are all part of this big country music community and it is a warm feeling it's supportive it's embracing it's all the good things that everybody wants that's why everyone is moving whether they're physically moving to Nashville or they're emotionally moving into this music zone so that's one of the reasons why me as a manager, I don't just support my artists, I support all artists because they're all kind of our babies. We, as long as we keep the remainder of our industry healthy and for that to happen, we need everyone's support. We need everyone to sort of reach out and sort of go the extra mile and not just look in their own little backyard of what they can do for the moment. It really takes all that and then some and I think that's why I agreed to be on this panel. I really don't really like to talk about things or do interviews so much because I sort of feel like if I do more interviews than my artists, then I'm in direct competition. So I don't like doing it. But I think this is important enough. And I think for you guys in this room and at CRS specifically, which I've been coming to for 25 years, it's super important to know you're really part of something amazing, something that a lot of people want to be part of and just honor that. It's fantastic. All right, well, thank you all. If we don't have any more questions, um, yeah, we'll call it a day. So thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.